Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Sanjay Suchak. I'm a practitioner fellow in the Karsh Institute for Democracy here at UVA. And today we'll be talking with three exceptional photojournalists about the work they've done covering difficult topics at home and abroad. The toll it's taken on them personally and why now more than ever, journalism is essential to strengthening our democracy. So before we get started, I'd like to thank the staff of the Karsh Institute for Democracy and Executive Director Melody Barnes as well as Public Service Pathways for co-sponsoring this event. A huge thank you to Sherry Winston and the Rotunda students and staff and our panel for making this possible. All right, so this should be obvious, but one of the most important things that a free press does is it provides a strong and stable base for any democracy. These are checks and balances for the citizens and by the citizens across government lines. And a great photograph, and I know you've all seen great photographs from these three panelists, and you probably don't know that you've seen them, but you have, they're all household names, um, will bring the reality of the situation to wherever you are. Um, so as a photojournalist to contribute to this, you have to be there. You can't report in from two countries away or call a source. I know you've seen people on TV reporting from two countries away. Um, you have to witness every situation that unfolds to make the photograph. There's nothing but a few inches of glass separating you, separating them from the person Sorry, there's nothing but a few inches of glass separating the photo that you see from the person who brought it to you. The glass is not a shield and that's what we're here to talk about today. I wanna give a quick heads up about some of the content and photos we'll be looking at today. Some of the following images contain sensitive content including physical violence, racism, and animal cruelty. Um, and with that uplifting note, I'd like to introduce our panelists. <laughs> to my left, your right, uh, Michael Robinson Chavez. He's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Native Californian, half Peruvian, all around renaissance, renaissance man. He's currently a freelance visual journalist based in Washington, D.C., soon to be Spain. I'm envious of that. And was most recently a staff photographer for 15 years at the Washington Post. Prior to that, he worked at the LA Times, Boston Globe, and Associated Press. He's covered assignments in over 75 countries, including the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the collapse of Venezuela, violence in Mexico, California's drought, Egyptian revolution, gold mining in Peru, climate change in Siberia, life in Brazil's favelas, the Hezbollah-Israeli war, and US-led invasion and occupation of Iraq. Basically like Forrest Gump of journalism. <laughs> he's everywhere. I'm still running. Uh, he's been named an eyewitness fellow, is a frequent lecturer, and has taught photographic workshops in over 20 countries. Next to him, Kirsten Luce uh, is an independent photojournalist based in Brooklyn, New York. She's a regular contributor to the New York Times and National Geographic. She's best known for a documentation of immigration and law enforcement on the border and a cover story for National Geographic looking at the dark side of wildlife tourism. She began her career at the Monitor in McAllen, Texas and the Birmingham News in Alabama and has been a tireless proponent of community-based journalism since. She was an adjunct professor of photojournalism at Columbia University and I just found out will now be a visiting professor at Harvard, congratulations and has taught photojournalism at the Foundry Photojournalism Workshops and National Geographic photo camps around the world. Finally, last but not least, uh, my friend, your friend, Ryan Kelly, you all might know him, local, local boy done good, <laughs> is a freelance photojournalist based in Richmond, Virginia, co covering news and sports. He was the staff photographer at the Daily Progress from 2013 to 2017 here in Charlottesville, and the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in its aftermath marked his final assignment with the paper. His coverage of that won the 2018 Pulitzer Prize in Breaking News Photography. Ryan discovered interest in photojournalism as a reporter and editor at the student newspaper at Christopher Newport University. Developing a passion for photojournalism, he interned at the Daily Press and freelance for newspapers around Virginia before joining the progress. He's been recognized with awards from World Press Photos, Pictures of the Year International, National Press Photographers Association, College Photographer of the Year, and Virginia News Photographers Association. And now that I've gotten through all of that, I can stop staring at this binder. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, thanks for being all, all of you being here today. Um, I'm gonna start off and I'd like to ask each of you why you got into photojournalism. And at the time you decided to get into photojournalism, was there anything happening in the world that sort of sparked that move for you? Um, I'll start with you, Michael. Uh, hello everyone, thanks for, uh, for being here. It's, I've never been inside the rotunda before. It's, Quite lovely, really beautiful. Um, wow, starting in photojournalism. Uh, no, it wasn't any particular event that brought me into it uh, so much. And um, some of the students here have already heard this story, but it was 
it was my mom being from Peru, and I went down there uh, after high school when I was working a job and didn't know what I wanted to do. Ended up going to South America, met my family in Peru, and was completely enthralled by the country, uh, the chaos, everything coming from a very boring suburb of Los Angeles. It kind of opened up my eyes to this whole new world and that side of my family. And uh, that's when I got into photography, and then um, I decided to go study photography and journalism, and I ended up at San Francisco State University, and my brother was there uh, studying journalism. He's a scribe, so he does the written word, and I do the visuals. And so uh, he bought me a book of photographers from the Magnum Photo Agency, which kind of really rearranged my molecules, and I realized, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to have someone pay me to travel all over the world and make pictures. So that's what I strive for, and then um, I was drawn to Latin America naturally, and so there were events in Latin America that really, you know, the Zapatista uprising, I don't know if anyone remembers, in 1994, Chiapas, I took my student loan money, and instead of going to class, I went to Chiapas, and uh, that was sort of the first thing I documented, and the AP saw my work, and that led to a job with them, so that's kind of how the, the ball got rolling. So I'd have to say the Zapatistas are probably that catalyst. That's great. Kirsten. Hi, everyone. I'm Kirsten. So I actually went to Albemarle High School, School here um, locally, and thankfully we had a teacher named Annie Waldrop come in for a couple of years and resurrect the dusty old dark room. I'm so grateful to her because that is where I started taking photos. I actually see one of my old classmates there. Um, and uh, so I, I got into art photography. I went to University of Georgia, studied in the art school there, and but quickly kind of realized it wasn't a good fit for me. I was interested in contemporary issues. I was also studying anthropology. I was getting interested in social justice, learning about the world. And um, I ended up taking a photojournalism class or talking my way into one because I wasn't actually technically allowed. And um, once I did that, everything clicked together. It kind of married all of my interests around um, you know, contemporary anthropology, uh, social justice, and community journalism. So from those couple of classes, uh, I was able to apply for and get an internship in Alabama at the Birmingham News, uh, full-time for six months, which is really where I learned the craft. Um, I also worked for a paper on the Mexican border um, called The Monitor in McAllen, Texas. That was extremely eye-opening, and from there, I started to get an understanding of what it's like to live on the border and some of the issues um, that were happening there. It was not, something like immigration is not a a daily debate in that part of the world. It's just a part of everyone's lives. And so it wasn't really until I left McAllen and moved to New York to freelance um, that I started looking at those issues from a national perspective. And I could apply all the local knowledge that I had gathered by covering anything and everything that happened in local news uh, to try to shift it into more of a national narrative. And, and, and uh, I, I knew so much about the area that I knew that the news was getting it wrong a lot or oversimplifying things. And so I kind of took it upon myself to try to add nuance to that conversation and come up with new and timely stories that were actually news and not just the same stories being regurgitated over and over. Um, so for the last 15 years, I've been in New York City, uh, mostly freelancing for the New York Times and whoever will pay me, and uh, getting down to the border whenever I can to start to continue to build this larger story. Um, yeah, that's it. How about you, Ryan? Hi, everybody. Um, I have been in this room before, but never on this side of things. This is wild. Thanks for having me. Thanks for paying attention. This is really cool. Um, I'm a lifelong Virginian. I grew up in Springfield, up in Northern Virginia. Uh, ended up in Newport News for a while. Ended up here in Charlottesville. I'm now in Richmond. Um, didn't think I would be a Virginian forever, but I've come to really enjoy it, in particular Central Virginia. Um, I miss Charlottesville all the time. I'm back here all the time for work and for visiting friends. I um, really like it here. Uh, my professional career started in college accidentally. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was kind of a lackluster student. Um, I accidentally found journalism through a news writing course as an elective, and everything clicked. I was suddenly interested in something and had something to focus on. Um, and I liked journalism because I was naturally curious. I enjoyed talking to folks, meeting new people, doing new things every day. And that was really the draw of journalism to me, um, as opposed to sitting at a desk behind a screen, being out in the world and doing stuff every day was awesome. I was really more into that than typical uh, class studies. Um, started as a reporter and an editor, picked up a camera to just sort of learn the basics, to be a little bit more well-rounded as a reporter, I thought. 
uh, had a really excellent mentor and still a close friend of mine um, in photography specifically, and it just sort of sped from there. Uh, really enjoyed photography and photojournalism. So photography for me has always been an entree into journalism as opposed to fine art or landscapes or things like that. Um, so I interned a couple of times at the Daily Press in Newport News. I worked with the university at CNU. And then in 2013, I landed a staff photojournalist job at the Daily Progress here in Charlottesville. Um, I was one of two photographers for four years from 2013 to 2017. And uh, we'll get into that period of time a little bit later on the next question. But um, since then, I've been in Richmond. Um, I've been freelancing, uh, working for, again, anybody who'll hire me. That's the best person to work for. <laughs> Um, a lot of it's been through Getty doing sports, and then uh, my news work has primarily been for Washington Post and AFP, occasionally AP and New York Times and folks like that. But um, whoever sent in the check that week is really the best client at that moment. Hopefully they send the check that week. They're, yeah, eventually. <laughs> You're sensing a theme here. Whoever, mercenaries. Were all <laughs> um, so it wouldn't be a photo presentation without some photos. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to kind of quickly walk us through their career and work in a couple photos. Um, I'd encourage you to go to their website, look at more, you know, they have all done so much that we could spend a whole day in this room going through it. So, Michael, would you like to walk us through your brief but spectacular slideshow? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, yeah, there's an image that just popped up. Latin America is very dear to me considering, uh, you know, my mom being from Peru, uh, I speak Spanish, so I've always had a natural draw down there. My first job was with the AP in Panama and Mexico. Uh, I got that one right out of school. I was lucky to get it too because I was graduating in two weeks and had no idea what I was going to do about work. Um, and uh, Joe Cavaretta from the AP said, hey, we have a job opening in Panama City. Can you move there in two weeks? I said, okay, yeah, I can do that. Let's go down there. And he said, be careful. Well, be prepared because it's really hot. So, uh, so I went down there and I've been working a lot in Latin America ever since. The photograph you're seeing up on the screen right now I made in Venezuela in Maracaibo in 2019. I spoke to some of the students earlier about this. The, um, the Venezuelan government was denying us any visas to go down there for many years, and then suddenly they just started giving them to us. I am convinced that someone in the foreign ministry, uh, one of our local people down there, producers that works with us, was plying them with chocolate from America, and they somehow the visa started magically appearing. But I won't attest to that in, you know, under oath, as it were. So I started going down there and doing trips, and I went, ended up going three times. The Washington Post ran multiple stories on it, including a 16-page special section about the collapsing infrastructure. Um, oh, this one actually hasn't been published yet, so you guys are getting the first view here. This is a story I just did recently. I've shifted a lot of my coverage to climate change and its effects on people, not just the migration going on, but the the threats to the democratic structure, their threats to their economic structure, uh, obviously the physical erosion and things going on, and that is in India on the Bay of Bengal coast, which is really feeling the effects right now, much like places like Louisiana, the eastern seaboard will be feeling pretty soon. Uh, but there it is taking a huge toll on what's happening along that coastline. Traditional fishing communities are finding they can no longer fish. They have to leave and go do construction. And traditional fishing, as we know it in India, is going extinct. Um, and uh, this next, oh, wait, does that go through four already? No. There was just two. It's a, it's a very brief career. It's like, <laughs> I've been to two places. Those are the pictures. And uh, um, this is from the, U well, that was from the Ukraine. <laughs> That was from the Ukraine war. It's, it's like this is the party mix, you know, that we got going on here. So I went to Ukraine in 2022. Oh my goodness, it's already been two years. Um, 2022, prior to the war starting and then at the beginning of the war, I did two trips over there. And this is when people were fleeing um, Mykolaiv, which was a city that was coming under constant siege and bombardment. And they were leaving to go to Odessa to try to escape the bombing. Uh, I have a fascination with the Cold War, having grown up during the Reagan years, obviously I wanted to go see the evil empire and all this kind of thing and did manage to get a trip to Russia to go do a story on climate change in Siberia. And I've just been fascinated with Eastern Europe. I've done a lot of work there. So when this happened, when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, it just, for me, it was a draw. I've kind of backed away from conflict photography, which I did a lot of uh, for about 10 years uh, in the early aughts. And uh, my daughter was born in 2010, and so that kind of scaled it back for me. Um, and I wanted to be around for her. 
to growing up. And, uh, but Ukraine was a, was a really strong draw, the story. And so I negotiated with her and she let me go. And, um, and I'm really glad I did because it is a story that now it's been going on for two years. And if you notice, the coverage is kind of going on the back burner a bit. Uh, but things are more urgent than ever, um, especially for Europe as a whole. Not, we're not just talking about Ukraine. So that kind of drew me back into covering that conflict, although I have not been back since. But um, as mentioned before, my family and I were moving to Europe, and so I'd imagine doing a lot more Ukraine coverage in the, in the coming months. And was there one more picture? Yep. Oh, that one. Okay, that's home sweet home. So that's, I grew up in Ventura County, California. This is the Central Valley. Um, this was one of the earlier global warming stories I did about the drought in the Central Valley of California. This was uh, historically at its worst point, 2014. But we didn't want to just do parched earth, you know, dead animals, this kind of thing. We really wanted to get to its effects on people. So I went with Diana Markham through the Central Valley and we created a year-long project uh, that I convinced the editors to run in black and white. I told them, you got to think Steinbeck, you got to think parched earth, black and white. And they just looked at me and said, OK, yes, yeah, spare us. We'll just go with the black and white. It looks good. So, so that's kind of a, a brief synopsis of those four pictures. Definitely go online and look for more. Kirsten. Uh, Tim, because I'm. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the work that I've done and I'm, I'm best known for is along the U.S.-Mexico border, as I said. Um, and this image was actually taken aboard a DHS Homeland Security helicopter, which will work in tandem with the Border Patrol. Um, so this is actually from these sand dunes near the border where a lot of migrants will try to cross and evade the authorities. This is a lone Border Patrol agent sort of looking out into the sand trying to track footprints uh, of people that have have evaded them. Um, I think this is sort of metaphorical for just how massive this issue is, how many miles uh, they're trying to secure, and this, the whole notion of border security and whether or not it's realistic. Um, as I said earlier, I like to try to, you know, we see a lot of imagery from the border of um, sort of apprehensions of migrants. Um, and what I like to do is approach my editors with really timely pitches that'll, that'll add something to the conversation on a national scale, I hope. So generally, I'm pitching to the New York Times. A couple of years ago, uh, we noticed that Governor Abbott in Texas uh, was trying to make a real strong stand on his own right about uh, migration in a state, claiming that um, Biden wasn't doing enough. And so uh, what we, if we could go back to that picture. Um, what we looked at was Operation Lone Star. This is where local um, police state police were actually authorized to um, enforce immigration law. This is totally unprecedented. It's not something that had been done before. So we saw people that had been in the highway patrol until about a month prior to this out traipsing around and trying to uh, track and apprehend migrants um, on private property. If we could go to the next one. Um, again, back on board the helicopters. Uh, in order to really see what's going on, I had to appeal to them to get access to the air because when you are in the air, you're actually dispatched to all the different areas of the border so you can make sure that you can see all the different assets, the local police, the state police, and federal police working together. Um, an issue like this, I mean, a photo like this, I think a lot of people have different reactions to it, which I find really interesting. Like people maybe on the conservative side of the aisle might say like, this is horrifying. Like look, all these people just flooding into our country. Um, people on the other side might say, this is horrifying. Look at all these people and what they're desperate and what they're doing. And that is the whole point of what I do. I'm hoping to use images of real life unscripted events that are happening to try to add to the conversation. This particular image was actually a group turning back and going into Mexico. Um, because they had been deterred by the helicopters above. Of course, they would cross later that night, most likely. A couple of years ago, the New York Times sent me back down with a new DHS reporter. And it was really great because um, her name is Eileen Sullivan. She's lovely. And also, she was new to the beat. And so we decided to like kind of stop and do an explainer for asylum and what that means. Because of course, we're seeing the effects of asylum trickling all over the country. But we don't really have a national understanding of what's going on. And so they sent us down there. We spent a couple of days on the border. This is outside of Roma, Texas, um, where we saw a lot of children that were allowed to cross. The parents were still being held back because of Title 42, um, pandemic ruling that allowed, uh, that Trump put into place that could allow, uh, minim that highly minimized the amount of traffic that was allowed to come across. Um, and 
it was nice because as the reporter was sort of getting caught up to speed, we also, we hope that we got our readers up to speed on these issues. <clears throat> One thing that I find fascinating, I try to, when I talk to people about immigration, I really try to listen to what they say and listen for gaps in understanding. And this is people on both sides of the aisle, all different political backgrounds, because I think that one big massive misunderstanding is the border wall and what it does and what it doesn't do. So quick lesson, 1900 mile border, 1200 miles is, is in the state of Texas, which means the actual border is the Rio Grande River. Well, you can't build a wall in the middle of the river. Like, in fact, you have to build it quite a ways north of the river for it to be structurally sound. So what that means is that there's this whole section between the actual border and the border wall where as long as you step on American soil, you can claim asylum legally. And so there's this misconception when people see these images of people flooding across the border, like, build a wall, build a wall. This wall is not what you think it is. In fact, in South Texas, it's built to be porous. This is extremely fertile land. So these are day laborers, undocumented day laborers that have crossed south of the wall, like they do every morning, to pick vegetables. So um, these are the kind of things that are not widely understood that I hope could be, because the amount of money that we're spending on initiatives like walls are not effective. <clears throat> Um, so we're going to totally change <laughs> pivot for a minute uh, because this is a, these are some images from a w story about wildlife tourism that I did for Nat Geo. Um, I only got on their radar because of a border story, but then thankfully they kind of kept me in the mix because um, I didn't screw that up too badly. And uh, they ended up sending me to the Amazon where we looked at native species and how they're being um, exploited for selfie tourism generally. So these are bottlenose dolphins which are baited each day so that tourists can touch them. If we could skip to the next one. Um, in Thailand, the biggest draw are elephants. Um, what people don't realize is that these elephants are trained using fear-based methods, namely a bull hook. Um, and so, you know, what, of the, though these are well-meaning tourists, the training that went into this sort of encounter is, is highly unethical and probably would make these tourists question what, what they're doing there and what they're supporting. Can we go to the last one? The same story. So again, these, there's an entire industry built around animal tourism, mostly so that people can have this encounter and take these photos and post them to Instagram. So we tried to kind of raise awareness about what these animals' lives look like after the selfie. The, the very, I hope this is the last one. Is this the last one? Okay, good. <laughs> um, probably the most shocking thing we saw, we traveled to Russia and uh, tracked down a polar bear circus. Um, they wouldn't speak to us uh, on the record, of course, and, um, but we do know that they have a metal muzzle and a metal training tool, so we believe electricity is used in the training um, for this. This is obviously quite uh, shocking imagery. Uh, we were never allowed backstage. I had to sit as an audience member to photograph this to, to bring it to Nat Geo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and after, uh, Ryan. Yeah, um, some whiplash here. After being taken all around the world for your previous two guests, we're gonna look a couple miles down the street here with a couple of pictures of mine. Um, I've done a lot of sports, I've done news unrelated to Charlottesville, I've done various other commercial work, but I think the thing I'm most known for and the thing that makes the most sense to talk about here at UVA in Charlottesville is my coverage of Unite the Right rally in 2017 here in Charlottesville. But the coverage of that isn't a day or even a weekend, it wasn't a fight and an incident, it was a whole summer, two summers, years, decades, centuries that built up to that point. It's a whole story that I was a little part of, but even my little part of the story is a lot bigger than I think a lot of people are aware of. Um, my involvement started with a statue, a statue in a park. Um, this was in 2016, it was for um, a bit of daily news. This was the first kind of inkling, not the first inklings, but the first inklings that were really getting traction about people talking about, hey, maybe we shouldn't have these statues displayed on public property, um, venerating Confederate generals in Charlottesville. Um, and nothing much was happening yet, but I was working for the Daily Progress, covering local news for a local audience, and so um, it was a local story. And for the next year plus, um, I did a lot of these individual daily stories that, looking back, started to form a body of work that I've continued to work on since then. Um, you know, a lot of the very obvious imagery of protests and statues coming down and things like that, but all tied to iconography and Southern heritage and the recognition of history um, and our understanding of how we talk about that history. Um, but it all came to a head very dramatically and publicly here in Charlottesville um, in 2017. So we can go to the next photo of um, 
what these statue conversations led to was folks like the KKK showing up in Charles Hill and rallying. And this was a dramatic moment. You know, at the time, it felt like, this is 2017, what are we doing? How is the KKK still around, much less showing their face in public? Um, and very quickly, the story turned from, this was the day a couple of them showed up and they got shouted down, but the next photo uh, is really what turned into the story of that day of police getting the KKK out, um, not doing a great job of addressing counter-protesters who were there who wanted to make sure that it was very clear that Charlottesville didn't welcome the KKK in town. Um, and this turned into a protest that the police deployed tear gas and pepper spray and people were arrested and tackled. And this, much more than the actual KKK showing up, became the story of this day earlier in the summer of 2017. Um, that just set the stage for later in the summer. This highly publicized Unite the Right rally had already been planned. Um, people who were avowed neo-Nazis and former KKK grand wizards and you know the, the alt-right was the term that was in vogue at the phase. All of those figures latched on to Unite the Right. Um, and our coverage day to day was things like permits being filed and court cases being decided and the location being changed. But then, oh wait, there's a court motion that you can't actually change the location. Um, you know, the minutia of local news covering local events before the national and international media was here, before anybody really outside of Charlottesville was paying attention to this story. Um, eventually that built and built and built and it led to August 12th, 2017. Um, there was a whole day, a whole weekend of violence and carnage and that's a whole other presentation that we don't need to go into here, but it led to this photo that I'm sure everybody has seen and we won't stick on for too, too long. Um, of the uh, later in the day after the protests had already kind of dissipated, a car attack, um, Heather Heyer was killed, dozens more were injured, um, sent people to the hospital, people didn't know what was going on. Um, and then later that next day, we can go on to the next photo, um, was this was that same street, the exact same uh, place that happened, uh, people gathering a makeshift memorial popped up for Heather um, and still to this day, there are chalk messages and memorials and things down on that street in downtown Charlottesville. Um, I like to talk about at least this tiny little bit of this body of work this way because most people in this room, I assume, saw at least that one picture from our coverage there. Um, but it was a whole team of people covering the whole local news, covering everything that was going on leading up to that and the aftermath of that um, locally, even though the one picture made it all around the world, you know, we're covering local news for local audience every single day um, at the Daily Progress. And this was actually, as it turned out, my last day on the job um, that had been planned earlier. It was kind of a coincidence, but uh, the next week I was living in Richmond and I was working at a brewery and I was trying to figure out how to freelance. And um, that, was, uh, that was my little window in Charlottesville. We can talk more about that later yeah. on. Thank you. Um, I think that's all a pretty powerful reminder of why we're lucky in this country to have a free press. You know, any of the topics they all covered in many places in the world, they could not cover. Or you could cover it, it just wouldn't get publicized. And so, you know, just if you needed that little reminder of why the free press is so important, I think you just, we just got it. So um, I'm going to come down the line with some questions now. Um, I'll start with Michael. We like order here. Um, <laughs> I'd revise this to 75 countries because I think it was 70 when I wrote the question a few months ago. Um, but you've been to over 75 countries on assignment. So I'm curious what the most difficult thing you've had to document, but also after 75 countries, what still surprises you when you get to a situation? I mean, there's, there's always surprises, right? It, it doesn't matter whether you're in your backyard or, or across the globe. I mean, there's something always there, especially if you're looking for it visually, right? There's always someone you meet or you'll go to an event thinking that's the event I'm going to cover and then you'll hear someone's story and that leads you to another story that's even better. You know, it's like, oh, that's a remarkable history. That's an incredible family history. So you just gotta listen. You gotta be open to hearing these things and not have preconceived notions of, of what it's going to be. I mean, that's part of what it is. We're observers. We, you know, our responsibility is to put you in our shoes in, in the situation we're in because you can't be there. Okay, it's not what you do. So we go there and it's our responsibility to do that fairly and accurately, right? Okay, here's what's going on in Ukraine. Here's what's going on in Charlottesville, in DC, what have you, and photograph that or 
do video, which now editors demand more of. Vertical video, social media, vertical video, you know, it's like, get on it. So, yeah, just do them at the same time, exactly, and, and interview someone else. Yeah. Hey, hey, by the way, and you have a day. Um, so those are all, those are kind of the, the reasons why I got into it, right, is to, to hear these stories and to, tell, and to do these surprises. Um, what was the first part of the question again? Um, I got lost in the... I got lost in it too. Uh, what was the most difficult thing you've had to document? Oh, probably the birth of my daughter. Yeah. Uh, that'd probably be number one. But um, I think, uh, gosh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, there's so many different examples. I don't think I could just say the most difficult. Um, you know, you're, it's that feeling of kind of helplessness, right? I know journalistically that I'm there just like for what I said, to bring you there, to make you feel what people are feeling, whether it's joy, frustration, you know, sadness, whatever it is. Um, but oftentimes you're there and you're making photographs and you're you know, knowing that those are gonna go to a venue, whether it's the Washington Post, New York Times, or, or wherever, that will hopefully have some kind of impact. But it's not up to you, right? It's up to you to do the job to the best of your ability. But oftentimes you just kind of feel, you know, whether it's migrants crossing the border or what have you, or a war zone, just this feeling that you want to, to do more, you know? And, and like you said, we're in a fortunate position that we can go to these places and do this work. Obviously, some countries, we can't go and yeah. do that work. I have been trying to get a visa to go to Iran for years, because I'd love to go to Iran and, and make pictures, and <laughs> they just laugh, you know, it's yeah. just never going to happen. <laughs> yeah, now should be a really great time to go over there. Yeah, exactly. It's like, hey, how about the, I'll just get a tourism visa. Um, so it's, uh, th th that frustration is probably the most difficult. Now, logistically, there are places that are very, very difficult. I've had times and I've done a couple of assignments in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is arguably the most difficult place I've tried to work. Uh, they have a piece of paper that is more valuable than life itself. So you, you get this piece of paper and you have to have it stamped by every minister of the town or state that you're in. And to get that, they have to tell you a speech about how great everything they do is and then you get the stamp. And you can't even make street pictures without the stamp from everybody. And you're looking around, there's just this, these gorgeous photographs happening everywhere around you and, it's, and you can't do anything about it. It's terrible, it's really frustrating. And so you get the stamps, and then finally you get that last stamp, and you're just like, yes, yes, you know, and you can, and then you can go to work. But uh, it's those things are are very difficult to keep your morale up because you're trying to get to the story of, of of these people that you know. We did a supply chain story there about the lithium batteries in our phones and laptops and cobalt mining and and just how horrible it is and how people perish for a dollar a day. And you know, you're trying to get to that mine, and eventually you do. And then when you do, it makes it all worth it because you can bring the story home. Does that get to it? Yeah, it gets to it. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I wouldn't be able to pick something out of 75 countries either, so probably. <laughs> yeah. Kirsten, you've mm -hmm. covered human struggles, the border, and animal struggles. And uh, I think you and I are both cat people. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, I'm curious how the animal cruelty aspect affected you. Did it affect you differently than the human struggles or in a similar way? Or could you talk a little bit about Sure. That? Um, uh, it was obviously a very difficult story to work on. Also, we were spending, you know, I think a month in Thailand, three weeks in Russia, and everyone's like, oh, wh where'd you go? What'd you see? I'm like, I spent the entire time at depressing animal attractions, you know? So um, it was it was hard. Uh, I was with a reporter, so we could kind of commiserate. And again, kind of to echo what Michael was saying, when you know that you have a built-in audience, like I knew that National Geographic was going to run this story, so that really kind of emboldens you to like make sure that you get the story and get, you want, the images to be as powerful as possible, to impact as many people as possible. Um, so I'm not sure that it affected me all that differently, but what I want to talk about is how, the res how different the response was from the public. I've never received as much mail as I have from that Nat Geo story. I mean, to this, I got one this morning. I mean, I got an email this morning, and the story came out in May of 2019 about how it impacted them. And that has been so... I mean, I love getting that feedback. It makes me feel great. It makes me feel like it, what I'm doing is worthwhile. But it also makes me pause because it's almost like the empathy is so uncomplicated for animals and people like are so ready to be outraged and so ready to even stop and write to me, find my email address and write to me. But we don't get that response with migrants, uh, you know, and 
in some ways, I wish we did. I mean, I wish that people's empathy uh, for you know people in Gaza or people in desperate situations in the Latin America that are trying to come here, I, I wish that that empathy was as readily available and that people were as horrified by those stories. Thank you. All right, Ryan. <laughs> um, so as you talked about, you won the 2018 Pulitzer Breaking News Photography for your coverage of the events of August 11th and 12th. And you're also a member of the Charlottesville community. So winning you know, one of journalism's top honors as the result of a death of a community member, that's something to reckon with. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, I mean, the closest word is bittersweet, but that doesn't do it justice because there's no sweetness when the death of a neighbor of yours happened right in front of you. And, you know, not only did it affect the people in that crowd, it affected all the people of Charlottesville and Albemarle and the people at UVA and, you know, frankly, across the country who were following the events and were just horrified by seeing that live news unfold. So it's, it's the Pulitzer Prize, right? It's the greatest possible honor in American journalism. So I was honored to be awarded with that, but I've always been very aware that it came at a horrible cost. And if I could snap my fingers and make a trade to make that car attack not happen and take the picture away and take the award away, I would do that you know, 100 times out of 100, no question. But it did happen, and frankly, I'm glad that it didn't have to be me. I'm glad a photographer, a journalist was on scene. I'm glad it was documented because I think that picture woke a lot of people up in a way that maybe hearing about a car attack without having something so visceral and just, you can't look away from that picture. You, you, you have to be drawn in by it, you have to be affected by it. And I think that was powerful. And so I'm glad at least, if this awful thing had to happen, at least there was documentation of it. Um, I also personally have met people who are in that crowd, who are in that photo. I've met um, family members um, and I've been able to have very personal conversations one-on-one -on -one that helped kind of ease my soul a little bit. Like none of them harbor ill will about the picture, about my having been there, which that helped me sleep at night as well because you know you never know in a circumstance like that. It's that pic that moment happened and that picture was on the wires 30 minutes later. Um, you know, there's no tracking down and talking to people in a situation like that. It's you just, you, we all recognize that it was newsworthy and it had to be sent. Um, but I'm very grateful that in the months and years since then, I've been able to meet and talk with a lot of the folks involved and, and forge some personal connections. Did, as a, a side question to that, did her family ever talk to you about the photo at all? Uh, yeah, I've spoken uh, with Susan, um, her Heather's mother, um, and she had nothing but nice things to say. And the same with Michael, who's the guy right in the middle of the photo flipping upside down. And so the two of them were the two I was most inclined to talk to. And, and being able to meet them and, and hear that they didn't harbor ill will against me was really, really important. You covered one of their weddings, didn't you, for the time? Yeah, that was, that was how I met them and oh, we spoke cool. for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, back to you, Michael. Uh, tragedy seems to be a constant, at least in your early years of your career, before you had your daughter. Um, famine, wars, disaster. Um, over the years, as the news industry, social media, and all that has changed, how has covering these events changed, and how has it stayed the same for you? I mean, covering events in general, or these more 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 tragic, like gut-wrenching sort of events? I mean, it's, uh, it hasn't gotten any easier, uh, that's for sure. And certainly, uh, you know, as far as the dissemination of the images and, and how that goes out, it's just now, now that we have these little computers in our pockets at all times, we we're talking about this earlier, just how it's this deluge of news, whether it's tragic or, or light and featurey, however you want to look at it. But before, remember, you know, before the mobile phones and all this kind of stuff is that news was curated. It was curated by editors. And so you would be going through a newspaper, a magazine, what have you, and you would have surprises show up, right? Because the editor said, okay, this has got front page potential. This is gonna be buried inside, but it's, you know, we'll give it some play. And so you'd go through and there'd be so stories that, that would, you know, get your curiosity because you didn't know anything about them. There would be surprises that popped up. Now, these phones, Everything happening everywhere in the world is brought to you instantaneously and without filters, without curation. Um, we don't even know if it's real anymore. So that's really changed it entirely. And that is the most dangerous part of it. The misinformation part is very frightening because you could be looking at something and I'll bring in kind of like a trivial matter. Um, Beyonce's album cover, her new one, the country one, 
It's impossible. The horse is trotting and cantering at the same time. The back legs are, can are trotting and the front legs are cantering. So, I mean, it's like it's all AI, obviously. My wife is an equestrian, so she was just, just like, she's like, look, I love Beyonce, but this is outrageous, right? And everyone in the horse world was just up in arms over it, right? So, but it's sort of you can't believe what you're seeing all the time, and you have to consider sources more readily. So, when I go out and cover some of these events, let's say the Bay of Bengal climate change story, you know, that is a story that is just to edify people about this huge portion of our planet's population that is losing their way of life, that everything's changing for them. Fortunately, the Washington Post is publishing it, so we, you know, we were talking about before, we have these venerable institutions that are kind of publishing the work, and so it lends it a certain amount of credibility, but of course it will still come under attack. But And they know to trust you because you have a track record of not... Right, you know. right, yeah, so they, exactly. Well, let's hope they trust me. <laughs> yeah. you know, after all these years, they haven't said anything. <laughs> so, um, but, but you, you, know, you need to have that credibility, and then, but people will attack it regardless. Like people say, oh, that's not true, climate change is a hoax. You know, that picture was photoshopped, and you'll get all these attacks, and, and that is the most difficult part. That's how it has changed, is that polarization is appearing on stories that would never have invited it prior. You know, everyone has something to say and oftentimes they probably shouldn't say it. So I know that sounds like censorship, but I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about online. But it is important that we continue to do this and credibility is of the utmost. So it's even more important now for all these institutions and us as practitioners to be completely credible when we're doing this. And there's been scandals in the photojournalism world of manipulation and you know, cloning and all these kinds of things and they should be exposed to the utmost um, so that you know, people have things to answer for. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, that's become the trickier part. And when I'm teaching workshops and talking to students, that's, you know, we have to ingrain that sense of ethics to it, that that is our biggest challenge. That's how it's changed the most. This seems like a good time to get into the politics of journalism question that I was saving for the end. But you know, as you sort of hinted, you know, journalism used to be apolitical, you a trusted source. You know, it wasn't if you were covering something, you weren't pushing a topic, you weren't pushing an issue. And all of you cover topics that now have a political bend to them. Um, and I know you're not covering them because you're trying to push an agenda. You guys are not activist photojournalists. You're just yeah. photojournalists. So. How do you deal with people who come up to you and, or approach you and say that, you know, your work on the border is pushing a liberal agenda mm -hmm. or whatever they would say about August 11th and 12th or climate change? How do you push back on that and how do we combat this in the future? I get a lot of this for the work that I do on the border. Um, number one, there's a lot of assumptions that I'm, you know, uh, a woman living in Brooklyn working for the New York Times. Like, there's a lot of assumptions about what my political beliefs are. And, Probably many of them are true, but I also, um, you know, I know that I don't know everything, and the time that I spend on the border, I spend the bulk of my time listening, and I spend a lot of time with law enforcement, and I listen to them, and I know that they know more than I do. Um, and what I've learned is that the more that more time I spend di down there covering immigration, the more complicated it becomes. And so um, I am extremely careful with the with the way that I conduct myself uh, on assignment and the way that I present turn around and present these stories to mainstream publications like the New York Times or Time Magazine or whoever I'm pitching it to. And I will say that it, it's been frustrating over the last, I've been doing this for 15, 20 years. Um, you know, of course, Trump's rise to power, his rhetoric around immigration was absolutely extraordinary and unprecedented. Um, and uh, what happened was that there was a shift up, say, the New York Times to sort of blame him for all the issues that went wrong with immigration. And I was so frustrated because I couldn't, you know, it's like I couldn't pitch a story that wasn't pegging him as the ultimate problem. And I'm not arguing that, that some of the things were problematic to a lot of people. But, um, but point being is that that's really short-sighted because our immigration system is so screwed up and it has been for so long. And uh, we're seeing now that you know Biden is making a lot of the same policies that the Trump had, but the media is handling it differently, and that that concerns me. Um, so I, yeah, it, it's been frustrating with how and when I can pitch certain stories and when there is an appetite for it. It it changes and that worries me. And I I don't know if it's changed dramatically or not, but I know that. Um, you know, a lot of the mainstream publications have a certain way of presenting things, and I wish 
that they could be more open-minded about, especially with immig well, the immigration. The landscape has changed so much. And yeah. I mean, you know, just in the time that we've been working in the last few years, people aren't reading anymore. They're, the media publications are desperate for readers, and so they will cater a lot of the stories to, to you know, write a headline that's going to get us a lot of click, a lot of engagement. Yeah. And so I'm not saying that the, the bulk of the story, the body of the story is being manipulated that way, but a lot of the headlines are. And they'll see that, hey, people are gravitating towards this topic. Let's write that topic up. Let's get mm -hmm. more of those headlines on a story. Let's angle it this way. Uh, and and the controversial it, stories circulate more and get shared and more. get shared more. So <laughs> yeah, so they, they see that as lighting the fire, right? Because they're, they're in, in tough, dire straits right now. I mean, the Washington Post is in, in tough shape right now um, financially. And, uh, as many are, so they're looking as ways to monetize and how do we do this and, you know, because they made the catastrophic mistake to begin with, right? Let, let's give it away for free mm -hmm. when they first went online. And, you know, it costs thousands of dollars to gather the news, but we'll give it away for free. It's like, it doesn't, you know, that's not a great business model. But, so now they're desperately paying, playing catch up on a lot of that stuff mm -hmm. and it, it filters down to how stories are bundled mm -hmm. and sent out. And you may have noticed it looking over the years, just like Kirsten was talking about. Mm -hmm. In my experience, um, my, the way I see people treating our work as politicized is all tied up with treating it as mi misinformation. That's what I see a lot of my stuff. People have um, either said that car attack didn't happen or it was staged if it did or it really happened but those people weren't involved or it, those people were involved but they had a good reason or it, it's constantly morphing and shifting conspiracy theories which it's easy to roll your eyes at and just ignore um, but it all happens online and anonymously and I've dealt with all these conspiracy theories, I've dealt with attacks and emails and phone calls and things and it's all happening anonymously and I'll occasionally when I'm out in the field working on something have somebody you know make a snarky comment or turn their nose up but oh the Washington Post, oh, the AFP, like the, you're the mainstream media, why should I trust you? And having a conversation face to face, I don't know that I'm changing their minds, but it's an immediate openness having a conversation with somebody that you might be covering. And you know, you can talk about like, hey, tell me what is your experience at this event or what is your experience in this life? I'm trying to get that. I'm trying to, you know, one of the things that drew me to photojournalism specifically was we're just showing the truth in front of us. And that has always really appealed to me. And obviously it's not as simple as that, but that, I think there's a, you know, a nugget of that that we should all strive for. And I think talking to folks face to face, you can help with kind of media literacy. You can help to explain like, here's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to tell the truth of the matter. What's your truth of this matter? I'm not out to get you. I'm not out trying to trick the readers. I'm not trying to change what happened here for some other audience, you know, like uh, here I am, I have a whole track record, like you guys were saying, that you can hopefully point to. Right. Um, and, and just the difference between that in person at an assignment versus the way people consume it in 30 seconds and have an opinion and have vitriol to spew is just completely separated from reality. And I, I don't know how we fix it. I mean, I don't have a magic bullet to solve well, that. I mean, revisionist history is having a moment, right? And, and I think when I look back at January 6th, I went up to, I went on the hill for January 6th. And when I arrived early, 8 a.m. on the east side of the Capitol, uh, they had these tiny little barricades, just a few Capitol Police up there, crowd was starting to build. I'm there with my cameras, and uh, you know, people were already getting pretty furious. They were pretty mad. They were shouting some things at the Capitol Police. I won't repeat here, but they were absolutely horrible. And so I'm taking pictures. I'm trying to capture that fury, right? And uh, Trump, I believe, had started his speech in the ellipse just to, you know, starting to rally the troops. And so the fever was getting hotter and hotter. Like, you know, he was pouring fuel on the fire. And I remember someone asking me, hey, who do you work for? And I said, oh, I'm, I work with the Washington Post. Oh, the Washington Compost. And I got all the litany of things like, oh, that's a new one. I haven't heard that. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, they, uh, you know, they were getting on it, and, and so I immediately asked them, uh, you know, like, you're liberal and all this kind of thing, and I said, oh, well, where are you guys from? And I'm like, we're from Idaho, and I just said, oh, Idaho, I did an internship at the Idaho Statesman in Boise, you know, it's a beautiful state, just to try to disarm them. And immediately, they're all, yeah, it is pretty, you know, and the Snake <laughs> River, I went tubing on the Snake River and did this and that, like, oh, yeah, it's great, I went on the Snake River, I had, you know. <laughs> I was in my inner tube and blah, blah, blah. So we just start talking about this kind of stuff and people around are hearing it. Now it's twofold. One, you're trying to cool the temperature, right? But if it goes down, if things get really bad and they start beating up the media, which is not, you know, it's something that could easily happen with this crew, that some of them might look at me and go like, oh, he's okay, you know, he interned at the Idaho Statesman, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, I mean, you just try to gain every advantage you can, right? So, and, um, 
And so, because certain members of the media were beaten up that day. Absolutely. It got really, really ugly. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that was kind of it, just like they, they were angry about it. And then, but then when I got to talk to them face to face as a representative of the Washington Post, you know, they're like, well, why do you do that? I'm like, hey, they pay me to travel everywhere and take pictures. Wouldn't you do it? And they're like, oh, yeah, I guess I would, you know? <laughs> and so you, you just, you just, that's that disarming thing that you kind of have in your toolbox, right? And, mm -hmm. and that really, really helps. Now, I'm sure they went right back to hating on the Washington Post right after I left, but, but still, you know, that's kind of confronting it. I think it's useful to remind folks that journalism and photography doesn't appear in a vacuum. It's produced by journalists and photographers. And when you have that conversation, it's a reminder. Well, let's like, hope it there's is. a human yeah, for, for now. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a human behind that camera. There's a human behind that byline. Like we're, we're out here doing this. It's not just some anonymous void that you're shouting at. Yeah. True. And just taking the time to listen and be a human when you're there and treating everybody with respect, yeah. no matter what their politics are. It's, it's pretty basic, but you're not going to get any photos if you don't do that. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm hearing is uh, nuance in conversation. So we're losing nuance in journalism and yeah. conversation is the, the thing the three of you have engaged with to sort of meet people eye to eye. So who do you think, is there anyone, and this is way out of territory here, but is there anyone you think news platforms or specific journalists that are doing this really well? And, or do you have ideas for I mean, there's more? massive organizations that I, I think that the New York Times often does it well, and they often don't, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, um, I, yeah. I and we don't know what the process is. I mean, the, the correspondent or the photographer in the field may be doing it well, but we don't know what's happening in the editing process, yes. right. which can change things. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you someone who's doing it well. These two. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> I've been trying to shake that reputation for years. Obviously, it hasn't worked. So I'm particularly cynical about this, in part because we're talking about institutions that we have worked for and we know we can trust and we looked up to as even, you know, in my case, before I was a journalist, before I was a photographer, AP was always there. Washington Post was always there. They were always doing this good work. Mm -hmm. um, but now, as you were saying, we've been compartmentalized, and there are entire swaths of the population who are walled off from legitimate journalism, and they're just not consuming it. So, you know, these legacy outlets can do all they want to fact check and tell the truth and, and scream the truth, but if people aren't getting that message in a way that used to be inevitable, what are you going to do? More, I mean, it's more impossible. than getting educated, they're just having their opinions validated because they're going to places that they agree with. Right. And or that's the vicious circle, right? right? Or circulating only the stories that they agree with with their friends and colleagues and family that also agrees with them. So unfortunately, <laughs> we can talk about great work that's being done, but over time, it's reaching a shrinking audience as far as the proportion of Americans. I mean, they don't even look at my pictures now. It's, it's, it's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Good time. Well, now you have a chance to directly ask your questions to these journalists. We have a microphone set out in the back there. Will is manning the microphone. Feel free to step up to the microphone, and uh, we're recording this, so um, it would be helpful to speak into the microphone so it's for yeah, posterity. Right also, get your steps in, you know, all that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and feel free to ask some questions. We have one taker. I have a question for Michael. Uh, you demonstrated the effects of climate change on people's lives and livelihood and democracy. Could you describe the effects of climate change on democracy and how photojournalism can inform? Absolutely. That's a, a great question. Um, yeah, the effects on democracy are profound, uh, especially in terms of the extinction of certain ways of life because climactically it's simply impossible to, to carry on. Um, you know, we're seeing this a lot on the coast. I have the most experience with that, so that's what I'll speak to. But you know, fishing communities that are, they're going extinct. And so that fish that used to be out there in abundance is diminishing in supply. That does not get to market. Uh, people become disenchanted. They become upset. They're having to shift to new forms of uh, you know, making a living. So these, a lot of these democratic movements in India, I saw this. You know, the fishing syndicate is a large and powerful syndicate politically in many of the states on the Indian coastline. Now their voice has shrunk. Their representation has shrunk. They can't say as much to protect these very coastlines. And so that is a fundamental challenge to democracy. Moreover, in India right now, under Modi, you know, democracy is being chipped away really quickly in the name of Hindu nationalism. 
And so as it's chipped away and chipped away and chipped away, these places that I've never really thought about that, they're just, this is the way we make our living, they no longer have an influence in how things are done via the vote, via its local economy. And so that is a really profound challenge. Mining communities in Peru, I've covered quite a few of those. You're seeing the same things happening in those areas. But um, I, I just think as people migrate and shift, strong bases, political bases, are shifting with them, and not always for the better. Now, urban centers are growing, and so maybe those urban centers will gain more power at the expense of the rural areas or the coastal areas. And so who's going to represent them? Where, how are they going to have a voice in any kind of Congress? And especially with erosion of media, who's going to be the watchdogs for those in charge of those areas? That's what I was going to bring up. Like hyper, when local media isn't covering like a mining company that now is going to do something totally irresponsible, then those these problems can get you know totally out of hand quickly. Yeah, there's no one to speak up anymore because yeah. they've all had to leave. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. But next question, and let's get some students up here to ask questions too. I see you. you're all here. I see it. Come on, students. Anyways, for, Come on, students. After you. <laughs> yes. Well. I'm a psychologist, and um, I really want to acknowledge you all for the work you do because I know in many cases you've put yourself in harm's way in order to bring us the truth. And this is subtitled The Emotional Toll, so I wonder, I, I came in a little late, so you may have spoken about it already, but I wonder if you would say some more about how you deal with the emotional toll and how us in the mental health field might be able to help you? I mean, I, I get asked this a lot and I still don't have great answers because um, I'm a work in progress, but I'm, you know, I'm definitely in therapy. I think that uh, the ways that when you're when you're putting yourself in these situations over and over, it's not like you have like classic PTSD symptoms, like also I'm not covering war generally, but um, Instead, like this sort of sense of hopelessness can take over because you're seeing so many people in horrible situations. And then there's a lot of self-doubt and there's worry that you could be re-traumatizing somebody or making them feel worse. Those are the things that keep me up at night. Those are the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, so I, you know, I have colleagues that I talk to and um, people that kind of get it and, and I can share with them and that's the community is extremely important. And, um, and I also try to take a step back when I need to, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, and not put myself in a situation where I'm going to be in a Motel 8 for a week on the border in a depressing situation if I'm not, you know, up for it. Yeah, yeah that's, it is important to be able to, to have people to talk to. I, um, when I was covering conflict nonstop, Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, in many places, it, it takes a toll, and this used to be kind of a taboo subject amongst journalists. You know, it's like, oh, you know, we never talk about that, and we're not involved. We're just there doing a job, and when we leave, and, and this nonsense, oh, the camera is my shield, you know. No, it's on the contrary. It's magnifying it right into your face, you know, and you're focusing right on it. So after many years of covering conflict, um, I was at home, and, and uh, I remember I got upset about something, and my wife said to me, says, wow, you know, you're really quick to anger, you know what, you need to go see someone because I'm not going to live like this. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, you know, I had no idea it was this bad, right? And so I went and saw a therapist while I was in California and, uh, and indeed, you know, he's just like, well, you got kind of, you know, symptoms of PTSD, which is this massive umbrella as you were talking about. Uh, so we ended up talking for, for many months, going and talking to him. And it's just a matter of coming to terms with it, right? Because you've seen so many horrible things and that feeling of that you can't really do much about it. You know, yeah, you're putting it out there and occasionally, you know, someone gives money to a subject or, or policy has changed or what have you, and that's a deeply satisfying feeling. But yeah, you gotta take care of yourself. You have to take care of yourself or, you know, your ability to do your job vanishes. Yeah, um, I completely agree. Uh, we didn't get to this, but this is the perfect kind of segue. The reason I left the Daily Progress is because I was completely burnt out and it wasn't good for me. I didn't leave for another photo job or another newspaper job. I left just because I needed to leave. Um, I was. I took a job at a brewery doing marketing, um, and I'm still there to this day. It allows me to keep doing freelance work and doing stuff like this, but I was completely burnt out after four years at a daily paper in a small community, and it's not, you know, 99% of the work I was doing was not what we just saw up on the screen. It was high school sports, and it was arts events, and it was UVA features, um, but just being in a small newsroom that was understaffed and under-resourced, working nights and weekends, um, I got married while I was there, and I wasn't seeing my wife, and I wasn't seeing my friends, and it was just burnout, 
because my entire life focus was on this job that wasn't loving me back. And leaving was the greatest thing I could ever do for my career selfishly and for me personally and for my relationship because I learned how to balance that. I can work on what I want to work on when I can, but being able to step back was hugely important. I'm a baseball fan. I, I need to be able to watch baseball. You know, I like to travel and cook. I need to be able to do these things that aren't work, that aren't photography, that aren't journalism. And that balance, I've determined, is exactly what I never had in my four years here and are really, really important to be able to keep doing the work in the future so that you aren't completely burnt out and stepping away entirely. Yeah, brewery is a good landing spot. It's, yeah, it helps. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. asking that question. That was on our list, but we just didn't get to it because we ran out of time. And Perfect. this whole thank panel you. was conceived um, <laughs> based on a situation that I had as a journalist that I didn't realize that all of these things were compounding until I was part of a mass shooting as just in the, in the crowd. And I didn't realize that all the things I had seen as a journalist were compounding me, and none of my other journalist friends talked about this. So I was like, we should talk about mental health. And yeah. We, got we talk about it now. Democracy, yeah. and so we didn't talk about it. This now. has been an incredible shift, by the way. You're right. This conversation was not happening, certainly not when I started 10 or 15 years ago. Even you know, when I was here in 2017, we weren't having these conversations. I think this is really, really healthy. And you may be, but it would be a very small group of people. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure. No one will run in a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, so Mary Douglas is an anthropologist who has a piece called Secular Defilement, and it's more or less about uh, ambiguity and being unable to kind of categorize things cleanly um, for yourself and also um, as others are sort of trying to put labels on your work. How do you constitute your work into categories or, or sort of make sense of them um, in a way that, that gives form to them? I mean, that's a good question. Um, I tend to try not to categorize my work. I don't want it to be pigeonholed one way or another. I, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a really wonderful photographer, Yosef Kodelka, uh, one of, I think, the best to ever lift up a camera. And he had it right in that he wanted his photographs to be ambiguous. He wanted his photographs to ask questions, to beg questions, to to want people to get further involved in them. And that, I think, is really successful journalism. You want the photograph to be out there, and you don't want the quick read. Someone looks at it, OK, I know the story. I'm done. It's like, OK, wait, what is going on here? Why is that happening? Who are these people? You want to spend time with it, right, to, to bring you into that story. So I mean, yeah, of course, there's certain categories of what we do. There's sort of sports photography and feature photography, long form. And we categorize them ourselves. but. You know, whether you're doing a piece on the border or climate change or, or you know, a sports event, vintage sports event or something, you know, you're, you're putting that out there for people to draw their own conclusions from it. And we also, you know, as photojournalists, we have to attach factual captions to everything that we do. And so that is our chance to kind of like validate what is there. And, and we also, we sign off on it. You know what I mean? Like we wrote that caption, we were there. We are journalists, that, that is true. And we, we can't be opinionated in those captions. But so thankfully, those are attached to every photo. So any editor that might pluck that photo out and try to use it would have that attached to it. And they would have to consider that and how they place it, hopefully. Some people do it better than saying, others. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, some but don't. certainly, my stuff gets co opted by the right uh, anti immigrant groups a lot. And what I won't do, I, I had access to post to the National Geographic Instagram, which is a massive platform, and I was, photo I was putting immigration work on there. The amount of hate, hateful comments that were attached to those photos, I just stopped posting there because. It was so insidious and horrifying, and, and I was worried that somebody would read those comments that was either in the photo or that you know that had an experience like that, and I just decided that that wasn't worth it for me right. personally. No, no, oh, yeah, so. absolutely. <clears throat> Good yeah. question. Mm -hmm. Are you a student? Uh, yeah. Oh, excellent. There we go. Nice to be Students here. asking <laughs> some questions. Hi. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, I'm pretty short. Hi. Thank you so much for the talk. It sounds like you all have been in a variety of different, very difficult situations. And I'm curious about how you enter into these spaces. I also know, Michael, you mentioned when you're in the DRC, you have to get all these stamps to be able to even take photos. But kind of from a more human and community perspective, when you're entering into these difficult spaces, how are you navigating it to be able to take photos of different people? Um, I mean, go yeah. ahead. It's a great question, and it really varies so widely because um, you never know how sensitive someone's going to be. So we spoke about this in a classroom visit earlier that uh, oftentimes when you walk into a tense, uh, emotionally loaded situation, you can sort of 
start, you get better at this the more you do it, but you can kind of scan the room and of course you're looking visually at what's happening, but you're also approaching people and watching their body language. And um, some people are much more comfortable in front of the camera. Some people really want to be seen. Some people want their grief to be seen um, uh, and others don't. And so again, it's an imperfect science, but you try to be a human, be present, put the camera down and try to figure out whether or not you are causing any more strain, uh, stress or pain on the situation. Um, and if so, of course, I've walked away from I mean, countless amazing light photographs that it's just not appropriate for me to take a photo. So I hope that answers your question. But every situation, of course, is very different. Yeah, Michael, that reference you made to the camera as a shield, early in my career before I knew what I was doing and before I had the confidence to do it, I did. I would use the camera as a shield. I would come somewhere and I would be uncomfortable and I'd be walking around like this and mm -hmm. just physically, interpersonally, nobody was seeing me. I wasn't engaging with anybody. And as my career has progressed and I've gotten more comfortable meeting new people and being in new situations, there's tremendous value in walking in with cameras over your shoulder or back in your car even and just shaking hands and meeting people and introducing yourself and just making sure everybody's on the same page uh, about why you're there. And then you don't feel like you're stealing something from them or taking something from them or exploiting them. It's, there can be kind of a give and take and it all comes down to having passion, compassion for mm -hmm. your subjects and the story you're telling. And I think there are a lot of interpersonal skills that aren't directly related to being a good photographer that are extraordinarily important they're, in photojournalism. Everything. They're crucial, and people know. If you come in and you're you know, lying or putting up some facade, people can read it quickly, mm -hmm. and they'll in no uncertain terms tell you to split. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, you know, we are, have to become experts in human behavior and anticipation, which we were talking about with the class as well just kind of those facial gestures when you're in a sensitive situation, like, okay, I don't think this is really the right place or the right time. I have to wait a couple days, then come back to this. Mm -hmm. Or oftentimes, yeah, they want their story told. They want to unload to someone. They mm -hmm. want to know that somebody cares. They're um, outraged. And yeah, they they're want, outraged. Yeah, they want to share. And so that's when you can you know, go to work and feel comfortable doing it. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. You, just, you can get that sixth sense going. Mm -hmm. There's this trite cliche about journalism and that we give voice to the voiceless, which I think we've mostly acknowledged as hogwash at this point. Everybody has a voice, yeah. but I think there's tremendous value in somebody who feels like they're not being heard and just listening to them and that maybe giving them the opportunity to tell a wider audience. Wow, Dominic has a question. What a surprise. <laughs> yeah, hey. Uh, you all previously mentioned the fear of headlines being more polarized with the focus towards online engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, what stories come to mind in instances where you have fought to or fought, um, where you've been forced to or fought to publish a specific perspective you believed in? Mm. Pub uh, published it in either medium, a print headline. or? But he's saying like a headline that was you felt was incorrect or was misrepresenting or polarizing. Mm. That's a good question. I mean, as a freelancer now, I don't have any control over the headlines, so yeah. I see them. But I will say that the New York Times is fairly careful about it. But I would say sometimes the social media, they'll, they'll frame things in a certain way that like lends itself to a like um, that can really oversimplify the story. And that can be very frustrating. Yeah, that's, that's what I've encountered. It, they, it can trivialize it, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, oh, we got to shorten it, make it sweet. Let's put it out there on on social media, yeah. it's just kind of, well, th one, the story isn't short, and two, it isn't sweet, you know, so let's do this right. Uh, I've had a couple of times when they had the wrong headline on there. That was never a, never great in my career. It's just kind of, you know, here's a story about Cuban refugees in a Panamanian military base. It's like, latest Panamanian baseball scores. Like, you know, like that's, not, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, but uh, I can't think of like a particular instance where I've been absolutely outraged. Smaller by, papers, uh, I'd say like that they were just trying to be clever and like some it was puns, really inappropriate. Really bad yeah. Puns. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've learned. Um, this is so much different when you're a staffer. It's one thing because you're working with the same editors and the same people day in and day out. When you're a freelancer, it's completely different. There's a there's an element of kind of like spitting into the void. Into and the you don't ether. Know what it yeah, you, you never hear any ever yeah. hear any feedback. Right. Um, but, well, unless you screw up. Of and you might hear yeah, back. Yeah, you yeah, don't, yeah. You don't hear back if you do well. Yeah. Um, but what I've learned in that you know, scenario is I really like to over communicate in those situations. So I'll give annoyingly chunky captions and I know we're going to get chopped down. Mm -hmm. I'll follow up at the end of the day with an email to an editor just being like, here's how my day went. Here was the vibe. Here's what's happened. Here's why I sent what I did. Here's maybe why you're not seeing what you expected. Mm -hmm. And that way I feel at least feel like I did you're my covered. part. So we're, yeah. all, we're all on the same page so that they know why they got what they got. And it's not just a guy picking between four pictures out of 20 that I, got sent to an FTP. Communication is crucial yeah. to and I, avoid that kind of thing. I also don't submit photos that I think might m misrepresent what happened. It's like there's certain photos that only make sense in context with other photos, and so I'm, I'm careful hmm. to submit those sometimes. Like, yeah. Do you well, ever mention that the to time, editors when you send them? 
Do you? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. But it, but I don't, like like he said, I mean, I send them in and the story might run, the next day or it might run six months down the line. Yeah. And so I might not hear about it before it, it comes up. So it, sometimes there's facial expressions or things that could that feel like they might misrepresent a situation and I don't want it to live on itself by its own and I won't submit it. And yeah, you gotta be a lot more careful these days. Yeah. Because we're working for larger institutions, you know, we're in a scenario for a day or a week or whatever, and so we have very personal first-hand knowledge of what we're covering, and that's pretty quickly lost outside of what's in the exact photo to the editor or the second-level editor or the copy designer or whatever. As so, more time goes by. Yeah, and as more time yeah. goes by, so like you really need to be confident in how you're showing what was happening. Yeah. I think it's important for I think it's important for the consumer of media. You know, it's fun to click on clickbait headlines and stuff like that, but if that's not what you really want to consume media that represents things fairly instead of the endless scroll of clickbait and subscribe. headlines. And subscribe and pay for journalism because what's free isn't good and free journalism ain't. Or at least get yeah. the games because that's basically supporting the New York Times right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just put six reasons why you're having bad luck on all my captions. Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. I get tons of hits. Yeah. Like, every time it's like. Taylor Swift in every headline. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir, I think this is probably our last question. Oh, there's one more. Well, Back to uh, emotion and psychology. Do you know the book, um, My War Gone By, I Miss It So? Anthony Lloyd, a, a British journalist who covered Bosnia and was a heroin addict and talked about the similarity of his being away from conflict and wishing to be back to that emotional explosions. Do you feel some of that draw to it? I mean, that's the adrenaline junkie, they call it in our terms, a very inappropriate term, but that's one that it's bandied about a lot. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, for many, it is sort of this addiction um, that they cover war and that's all they do for their entire careers. And if you notice, 90% of them, not married, don't have kids, don't have anything really going on, don't own property, don't, they're just out there doing their thing, right? Um, and I've known several people uh, like that. Um, Mr. Lloyd, I don't know. I never met him. I know the name because his coverage of Bosnia was pretty famous, but there was uh, Keith Carter, the South African photographer who took a very famous photograph that won a Pulitzer Prize of a vulture next to a starving Sudanese child during a famine uh, that, um, not just for that photo, but the photo became really famous and it traumatized him uh, and he ended up taking his own life. And he was also, he was an addict, um, but he was constantly going to these events, um, you know, tragedy and conflict and, and just one after the other. And it, it takes a toll. There's a, a book called The Bang Bang Club about South African photojournalists, uh, you know, during the height of the township riots and everything that were going on um, that is really telling about a lot of those kinds of feelings and difficulties. Uh, they made it into a film too, which is good, but the book is definitely superior. Yeah. Do you have, is it a quick? Yeah, it, we can do a quick question. Yeah, we'll do one quick. more. Thank you. Have any of you ever been in a situation where you wanted to take your photojournalist cap off and actually step into the scene and help or do something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. without a doubt, yes. Um, and there are times when, when when that happens, I will say, uh, I don't publicize it if it does happen. Um, like some journalists Come do. on, speak up. I feel speak. like, I feel like um, right now it's become like, everyone is a freelancer and everyone has their own brand and they're broadcasting what they're doing. And so I feel like there's a lot more social media presence of journalists kind of like stepping in, in my opinion, sometimes too much. Um, mm -hmm and then being like lauded for it like and i that makes me uncomfortable because i mean we could all be just instead of buying a plane ticket we just send money to the right people you know there's there's ways we could help uh if that's all we Absolutely. wanted to do so you know my primary role is a photojournalist my primary concern is not to make anybody feel worse um and uh but yes to answer your question without a doubt <laughs> yeah. i think that's the nature of being human Mm -hmm. So thank you all for coming so much. Thank you. Thank you support all. your local journalists. Support your local newspapers. Support these journalists. Give them a follow on social media. Look at their work. And uh, don't build silos, because the only silos you build are your own. Talk to other people. 
Um, I'm no, doing 20% discounts on subscriptions uh, afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Day. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.